Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Session 1 of our three-part content marketing webinar series. I'm Trish Torrance, Manager of the Association, and today's session is Building a LinkedIn Profile for Yourself and Your Business that Drives Engagement. It's our hope that these webinars will give you some practical methods of making the best use of content marketing to navigate today's digital marketing landscape. I'm going to give you a very brief introduction since my roof is being done and it sounds a bit like it's about to cave in. Our facilitators today for the sessions are Marie Wies and Carly Sisson of Marketing Copilot. Marie has presented to our group in the past and we've had many requests to bring her back to delve deeper into the somewhat confusing world of social media. Marie is a 25-year vet veteran of the B2B marketing world, past chair of the York Technology Alliance in the Greater Toronto Region, and a workshop leader at the Regional Innovation Centers in Ontario, where she teaches early stage companies how to turn their websites into their best sales tool. Marketing Copilot is a digital marketing consulting practice which helps business owners find customers and keep customers using the power of content marketing. During the workshop, we encourage you to make notes on any questions you might have and forward them uh, via the questions feature. Carly will give you some instructions on how to do that. All presen uh, presentation slides will be available on SlideShare after the presentation or through the association. And the webinar recordings themselves will be available and emailed to you at the end of the series. So with no further ado, I will turn it over to Marie and Carly. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're coming to you live today from beautiful downtown Markham, and uh, we're uh, excited to be part of this series. We've been working hard on the content for you, and uh, we're quite excited to present it today. Here's today's agenda. Um, uh, why LinkedIn is a useful business tool for your business. We're going to cover off on some statistics to start with. And then we're going to talk about 10 steps to an all-star personal LinkedIn profile, how to build and leverage your company page on LinkedIn, and how this all fits into your overall content marketing plan. As Trish mentioned, um, please start thinking about your questions now. We're going to leave time at the end for questions. And there's a, a question feature in the GoToWebinar box that's probably showing up on the right side of your screen. And we encourage you to keep those questions, um, write them down on a note, and then uh, towards the end, please put them into the questions box so that uh, we can read them and we can respond to them as they come in. So without further ado, um, what we want to do is uh, show you first and foremost some stats. And here's where we want to get you thinking, okay? We think you are what you post. And uh, I know the nutritionists used to say you are what you eat, but we really believe you are what you post. And take a minute right now as you're listening to this and, and write down all the places where your personal profile or words about you are available online. For me personally, um, I have, and this is, and this is me, um, I have a LinkedIn profile, I have a Twitter profile, I have a Google Plus pro profile and a SlideShare profile and an about.me. That's where this little uh, one-page website homepage comes from, about.me. Now, what you'll notice is not there <laughs> is Instagram or Facebook or a bunch of things. And we'll talk in a second about why that's not there. But I want you to start thinking about this and take a minute and write down uh, a list of all the places where you've got information about yourself. Okay, and try to keep it in terms of what you might have for business, but we're going to talk in a minute why these things cross over. So it's important you create a thorough list of all the places you are online. It's confession time for me. And uh, I want to say to the audience today, I personally hate social media. <laughs> and I, I think that um, it frustrates me. Um, to a certain extent, it made me feel uncomfortable uh, because there was so much information that was getting shared um, about me and the way I had to think about myself online. And for me personally, I just feel like sometimes it, it's a waste of time. 
And I'm probably mo no different than most business owners. And I've got my business to business hat on today when I share these things. But I also feel that very much from a personal perspective. And I bet you there's lots of people um, listening to the webinar today who probably share the same kind of frustration and emotion about the confusion and frustration that social media causes. Now, I, I recognize that sometimes demographics play into this. If you're of a certain age, you struggle with it. It's a little bit easier if you're younger and you've kind of grown up with it. But I still think to a certain extent that it, it really forces people to think about their personal brand. And that's an uncomfortable thing to think about. So um, the question that we have posed in many workshops and conferences, and I think we even did to this audience, is, is it a useful business tool or is it a complete waste of time? Well, we can have a personal opinion about it, but... The stats we've, we've pulled together here today are kind of interesting. So Canada ranks in the top three countries around the world in online engagement. We love using online stuff in Canada, which is kind of interesting. We lead in social networking engagement. And I'm going to talk in a second about our cousins to the south, who everybody thinks they're ahead of us. But I'm going to talk about a few places where Canada actually excels. 40% of Canadians embraced Facebook or Twitter by the end of 2010. 40% of us are online doing something with these tools. And 50% big increase by the end of 2012. And it's even, it's even greater today. So is it a useful tool? Well, um, here's a little chart from eMarketer.com that shows about Facebook users and penetration in Canada and what they estimate so you can see the 2015 stats and where they estimate this is going by 2018. 20 million people in the country are expected to access social networks at least monthly this year. 7 in 10 internet users or 56% of the total population will use networks this year. And those will raise like those rates will go up to 70% by 2018. Like that's phenomenal. Um it's phenomenal growth. It it, it it's crazy the way these social networks have taken off. In Canada versus the United States, penetration rates put Canada right in line with the U.S., um, where 55% of the population, in fact, we're ahead of the U.S. in what people are using. And the vast majority of people are on Facebook, and that translates to just over half the population using the social network monthly, which is pretty phenomenal. It's pretty incredible, those, those kinds of numbers. Um, for Twitter, the growth, uh, the Twitter audience in Canada is still in the double digits. Twitter is really growing. And I think that's important for people to take note of, um, one third of social network users in Canada will use Twitter this year. And it, it, it's pretty phenomenal that for us, um, that's over 8 million people and it represents about a quarter of our total population. And Twitter's more popular in Canada than the U.S. Um, we're just 16% of the po total population is using it versus 20% using Twitter up in Canada. Um, so again, a little chart from eMarketer.com that's just showing what's going to happen by the time we hit 2018. And uh, they expect it to go up to 23% of the population, which is pretty amazing. And that's accessing an account on any device at least once a month. With respect to LinkedIn, which is the topic of our presentation today, um, there's now over 313 million members worldwide. They pick up two new members every second, which is just, again, if I think about how long it took people to adopt the radio and how long it took people to adopt TV, it's 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 baffling how quickly um, these tools are being adopted. 66% of members are outside of the United States, which is very interesting. And 39 million students and recent co college graduates are on LinkedIn, which is the fastest growing demographic on LinkedIn. And I know it's difficult because I've moved from slide to side to show you stats on different social media tools, which are probably the most popular being Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. But what you didn't see in some of those stats is LinkedIn and Twitter are dramatically on the rise while Facebook is actually in decline. There's actually not the pickup happening on Facebook. Um, and if you talk to people, um, young people today, 
they're moving away from Facebook and they're more interested, especially as they're graduating and getting onto LinkedIn, they're more interested in using Twitter to communicate with friends. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute about what that means for us as business people and what we should be thinking about in our overall social media strategy. But, um, I think the most important takeaway from this slide and the previous ones is that LinkedIn is hugely on the rise. And that's really great news for us as business people about whether or not certain social media tools are useful tools and not a waste of time. The observation about social media just at the very highest of levels is that it has exponential reach and it's become part of our daily lives. Um, We've also been doing some research lately on mobile usage and the dramatic increase in mobile usage. I think these social media tools coupled with better internet networks, coupled with the more uh, the bigger proliferation of mobile devices has made it very much part of our daily existence. What's really great about social media that I do like about it, aside from the fact that I always struggle about how to present myself or how to talk about myself, is that it makes us think about our message and our content. It makes us think about keywords. It makes us think about those things we personally want to be found for. And the most important thing when you think about social media as a really useful business tool is you have to remember that it's blurring the lines right now between company and individual. And the reason I like that as a marketer is that people buy from people. They don't buy from quote unquote companies. We don't sell to companies. We buy from people and never before have we been able to access information that helps us understand the individual. Um, remember it was only maybe five or six short years ago when if we were trying to get to know somebody at a large corporate account, or even we were trying to understand whether somebody was, um, a legitimate business to buy from, we didn't have a lot of options to go look them up and figure out who they were. And now it's as easy as popping on LinkedIn, searching somebody's name or searching somebody's company and seeing really important information that comes up if we're trying to do research or due diligence on that company. And it, it blurs the line between how we present about ourselves versus our company. And so we have to think about how those things intersect from a business perspective. And it's made us adjust our thinking, which as much as, again, I get frustrated by it, um, I think the really positive benefits of this is that um, you do have to think about you as an individual versus your company, your company versus your customer. And as I said a few minutes ago, people don't buy from company, they buy from people. So you have to remember how you're presenting yourself online. And product versus problems. And we're going to get into this in a little bit, but customers are not targets. They're people who are interested in solving their own problems. And to just be trying to get out there on social media with product information is probably not going to do a lot for you or for your company. What you really have to start to understand is people's problems and how you can talk about that in terms of how you solve those problems so that people will want to pay attention to you. And they'll want to pay attention to you as a company and they'll want to pay attention to you as a person. So we're going to talk in a few minutes about those kinds of things. So I think the really positive things about social media is that it's making us adjust our thinking. Common misunderstandings though, and this is where I've spoken to a lot of CEOs lately, and they are very frustrated by social media. Um, because they think that, well, if I'm on Twitter and I have 3,000 followers, it's going to do something for my business. But what we've tried to explain to people is that social media is not a silver bullet. Um, I think the days of a silver bullet and having something that's going to be your only source of lead generation are kind of over. You need, a, you need an integrated approach to this. And social media cannot be the main KPI um, key performance indicator for your content marketing because in a lot of cases number of followers or likes or activity that you're doing on social media may or may not lead to what you want to do from a sales and marketing perspective so you have to be careful of that the other thing that I think is difficult is that social clouds are judgment of good and bad content and 
Um, I had an experience recently where somebody in the insurance industry was trying to reach out to me and they'd started emailing me. Um, and I'm, I'm struggling to remember whether or not it was with or without my permission. And their content was just horrible. And I bring that example up. The headline in the email was bad. The way they would put the email itself together was bad. It had a bunch of um, misplaced logos. It was all over the map. And I thought to myself, somehow this person thinks that just because they have access to email or just because they have access to social media that they can just put anything out there. And it, it clouds our judgment because it seems so easy to use. And that leads to the next point is just because it takes five minutes to open a Twitter account doesn't mean we're good at it. And just because it's easy to access and easy to use doesn't mean it's easy to understand. And doesn't mean that it's easy then to develop content. The other thing that I think people misunderstand is the phrase interaction. And a like, a tweet, a share, it's an action. It's not an interaction, which means that if there's no physical or measurable response associated with that like, tweet, or share, it's probably noise. And that's the next point is if it's not part of your sales process, then it's noise. It needs to lead to a physical and measurable response. And I think um, that's where people continue to struggle because they have ta- they have a hard time understanding those analytics and they have a hard time understanding um, the way in which they're going to measure certain things within the entire buyer process and sales process. So here's just an example to help you kind of orient yourself to these concepts. So the difference between social content and sales content. Okay. Now I know we're online virtually today doing a webinar and I'm not going to ask you to put up your hand, but take a minute and read these two articles. These were headlines in two different articles that were then posted in social media and asked people to click through to the full article, which was posted Um, in different places. So article number one, myths about marketing automation, you need to know. Article number two, HubSpot versus Infusionsoft. And those are two very specific names of products, which is the best marketing automation software. So take a minute, think about it. In your mind or in your opinion, which do you think performed better? So the answer Number two, number two performed better from a click-through rate, from people landing on a landing page um, to read the information, the time that they stayed on page, and the number of people who converted through to a call to action. And the reason is, if you go back to number one, myths about marketing automation you need to know, it was an observation. And it's lovely that you can talk, if somebody's thinking about marketing automation, they can passively consume the content. But a comparison is getting the brain to actively start to think about choices. And when people click on it, they've actively started to think about choices and therefore it pushes you into the buying process. So that number two headline performed three to one over the number one, which is how you need to think about just social content versus sales content and what you're doing with your content. So with respect to some best practices that we highly recommend before you jump into any kind of social media. And you probably, most people on the call today, they probably already have a LinkedIn profile and that's why you're here figuring out how to make it better. And that's great. Maybe you've got a Twitter account for your company and and all those kinds of things, but you need to really start by producing customer centric content first and then decide where it needs to be shared. And we're going to talk about that in a minute because, um, A lot of companies jumped into social media and made the same mistake. We're business to business company. We sell to other businesses, but we need a Facebook page. And to be honest, Facebook has a very specific purpose. And yes, it's got big reach. And yes, it's got a lot of users. But think about what those users are doing on Facebook. They're looking at their Aunt Judith's holiday photos from Cancun. They're not looking for information about business solutions, whereas they might be apt to click on value added content in their LinkedIn when they're during office hours thinking about business. So produce your customer centric content first, then decide where it needs to be shared. 
Social is great for SEO, search engine optimization, and keywords and testing content. And I think that's where you want to start thinking about which channels you're going to use and how you're going to use them. Don't let social media hinder what needs to be said. I'm sure those examples that we used of the Article 1 and the Article 2, especially if you're a company who might want to compare your services against one of your competitors in a specific product category, would be really uncomfortable by that subject title, which one is best for you. But that's where social media is very powerful, that if you're honest, transparent, you're sharing, sharing relevant content, um, then social media can be quite powerful, but don't let it hinder what needs to be said um, and produce content your sales team needs today and reserve, reserve, resist the urge to be liked because what we tell people is likes don't pay the bill and we've helped a lot of clients do initial website analysis of their websites and one of the things that we notice when we go look at blogs as an example because blogs and blogging can be used as great headlines in social media to drive traffic back to a website and what we notice about a lot of blog content is that it's very customer centric, meaning or client company centric, meaning that it's here's our our corporate picnic and all the employees at a corporate picnic. And here's the charities that we support this year. And here's some new information about our products. And if I went into their analytics, I would see that these blog posts just aren't performing um, because while they might have put their company picnic or their charitable um, endeavors on their Facebook page and they got some likes out of it, that's not helping somebody in the buying process. It might be lending some credibility to the company, but it, you know, 10 best practices to getting your marketing automation tool up and running. That's really important content. And you can see somebody click through from something. So what we like to tell people is likes don't pay the bills. It has to be leading to some kind of action within the sales process. So let's talk now about your um, personal LinkedIn profile and um, what we consider 10 steps to an all-star LinkedIn profile. So first and foremost, I cannot stress this enough, um, get serious about your photo. Um, we've seen a lot of bad photos, as I'm sure you have on LinkedIn, and it, it, get a really professional looking, I mean, it doesn't have to be, corporate but get a professional looking photo I, the ones we think are just awesome is the person who does the photo from the waist up and they're standing about 30 feet away from the camera and part of the great thing about social media and, and LinkedIn as an example is that it's allowing you to show your real person so make sure that photo is really good and if somebody took it and it's all grainy and really blurry um, do something about that um, professional names only on LinkedIn in particular, it's perceived as a business tool. Um, don't put your nickname there. Don't put, um, you know, what your friends might call you. Uh, use your professional name and the name you go by. Um, the next thing that's really important, and somebody pointed this out to me recently, um, we've been doing some work uh, with the social media coordinator at TD Bank, who's head of employee engagement. She, they use social media quite aggressively at TD for recruitment and um, staff engagement. And she works with a lot of executives to just show them that you might have a job title and your job title might be um, vice president of business development and customer service. You know, there's some generic ones. I'm kind of making that up. But the point is, your professional headline and what your job title is, is not necessarily helping you position yourself. And you might want to position yourself about around being an expert in hydraulics or an engineer in hydraulic installation. And you want to be showing that you're really good at something that your customer might be searching for. So your headline is really important. Don't just put your job title in there. Think through what you do for customers and why that matters to them. Optimize your location. Um, be very specific about where you're located. Those stats earlier pointed out that there's a lot of people from outside North America on LinkedIn and especially who you sell to and your buyers and their opinion around where they want to buy from somebody. It's really important that you optimize your location. Align your information on your profile to your industry. 
Um, in the early days of LinkedIn, and I made this mistake myself, I thought it was a place to go put my resume. But the resume and the way that you position yourself for a company who might want to hire you is very different than how you might want to position yourself in your industry. And so resist the urge to just go put your um, resume in there. Think about how what you do aligns to what people are doing in the industry, and that will really help people identify when they go to read your profile. Um, don't forget to customize your profile URL. Um, what will happen is LinkedIn will auto-generate um, a URL for you and we're just showing there in the green box that it'll auto generate something with your name and a bunch of numbers that's really kind of crappy. Um, you can go in and customize and just make it in this example they're using just Neil Schaefer versus all that other stuff. In the early days I went and customized my own so it's linkedin.com forward slash marketing copilot and we'll talk about in a minute why there's positive and negatives to that because now you're tying yourself very closely to your company page which for us as a smaller business is not bad but you want to think about how you might want to customize that link think about keywords not just in your pro professional headline but think about it throughout your profile especially if you're trying to talk about why your company's great at something make sure those keywords are in what you do and how you execute it um, recommendations are really really important and if you've noticed lately in LinkedIn there's a box that says you know how close you're getting to an all-star LinkedIn profile and until you have some really good recommendations on your page you're gonna find it really tough to get that 100% rating we also suggest that you build your online network from real relationships and this is where I get frustrated by social media and, and, and LinkedIn in particular and you have to make a decision about this personally I don't just randomly accept um, invitations from people if I don't know them or they haven't personalized a note to me that says, I met you at such and such and I'd like to connect or, you know, I heard you speak and I'd like to connect. If you just are randomly sending me stuff um, and you don't have a great profile, chances are I'm not going to say yes to connecting. But those are decisions you want to make. And it's really important, though, to build from real relationships because you're going to find from time to time people are going to reach out to you and see, I see you're connected to so-and-so on LinkedIn. Could you give me a recommendation? And that's where it becomes quite powerful because now you can reach out to people and vice versa. And manage your endorsements really closely. I think that that, that is very important to be deciding who is endorsing you at a personal level and make sure that those are the people you want endorsing you. So those are what we feel are kind of 10 steps um, to an all-star LinkedIn profile. And again, if you've got questions about that, please note it. We're going to take time at the end for questions. So three questions to ask yourself before you hit refresh on your profile. What makes me great? And again, if you're like me, I always struggle with that question. I find it can be very self-serving to go on about what makes you great. But you, that's really what you want to sit down and think about. And you want to think about what makes you great in, term of your, in terms of your business career and the things that you've done. Um, brands are built around superlatives. And the example we're using here, Apple's the most innovative. So... Again, we, we do a lot of work in value proposition development. It's, this is why it's really important that your company have a value proposition so that you can decide if our company is the most innovative. We want to build our brand around that. If it's the most cost effective, we want to build our brand around that. If we're the ones who looks for the best people. So there's things that you want to think about in terms of the business brand, but more importantly, your own personal brand. What makes me unique, um, your expertise in a niche area or your personality characteristics, and then what makes me compelling? Um, who needs to know you? Who's making decisions about you? Who can benefit from your services? Uh, and I love this last one. Branding, uh, personal branding is not about being famous. It's about being selectively famous. And you know, nobody is going to be uh, one of the Kardashians on Twitter. I mean, it's it's that's just ridiculous. The anonymous hordes of people who follow the people on Twitter. But what you do want to be is selectively famous within your industry that you're out there. People know who you are and they're they're associating you with something that you do really well in the industry. And I think that's what's most important.
Um, six ways to strengthen your LinkedIn present. Build, build your personal brand, as we've been talking about. You know, what makes you unique? What makes you compelling? How will people benefit from the network of people that you know? Spend some time on the weekend. Do it this weekend if you haven't been, if you haven't been in there and you haven't been doing it. And explore the people that you may know. Um, I make it a point to try to spend 10 minutes every morning, no more, no less, <laughs> um, on LinkedIn every day. And I'm looking at people I know, people who've asked to connect. Um, I often communicate to people via LinkedIn when I'm looking for some help with things. Um, review your suggested connections and, and add people. Um, post status updates. LinkedIn has just done something very interesting. Um, a few years back, they had a widget for lack of a better word where you could bolt certain things into your profile and one of them was if you had a wordpress website and were doing a wordpress blog you could build a connector between linkedin and your blog so that every time you posted a new blog it would update and come in through linkedin and now um What's happened is they're allowing you, they're giving you a content management system within LinkedIn and they're allowing you to post right within LinkedIn. So if you or people in your organization are writing great blog articles, you have to make sure that you're posting in LinkedIn as well as um, on your website. And you don't have to post the whole thing in LinkedIn. You could post an excerpt that then leads to the full story because you are allowed to put links in. Um, but this is what makes you visible to your connections. And this is what helps people realize you're associating yourself with really relevant content. Join groups. Groups are really important, particularly if there's industry groups established. You'd be really um, surprised at the kind of questions that get asked in groups. And sometimes they can be your best source of content for your own website or for your blog topics. Um, there's a, a feature in LinkedIn called Pulse News. And this is really great because it allows you to figure out where to share articles and how to share in your network. And the last point, again, this is for me personally, and maybe it's just my demographic, my age, but, um, you know, don't just see it as a channel where you're pushing information out. If you don't engage in social media and like other people's stuff, and that's why it's called social media, the idea came from us interacting with each other. And that's where you need to be commenting and sharing and liking and doing lots of things in the tool if you're going to get the most out of it. So those are really important things to consider. We're going to switch now to your company LinkedIn page. And this is a little bit more, even more misunderstood on LinkedIn and mostly because LinkedIn, um, LinkedIn is changing this so often. So Carly, when was the last time that, you saw a significant update on the company page. I mean, you've been tracking it pretty closely now. and Yeah, it was just in the new year, and they added in all the targeting options for sending your post to targeted people okay. um, and audiences, and you could really segment, and that was that's the biggest. And then probably in the fall when they added in the – publishing section which you were speaking about yeah so there's been a couple of pretty big changes on the LinkedIn company page and um, Carly and I have talked about this before and we're always sort of surprised when um, we see this but if you do have a company page within your company nail down really quickly who manages it and who has access to it and where the username and password is um, we've noticed this that we'll go into a company and help them integrate their social media into their website as an example and they'll say well uh, we had Bob, the summer student here last year, and they set up the company page, but we don't know how to access it. Uh, so this is a real problem because then you've got information hanging out there in the world, in the Internet, in this thing we call virtual reality, <laughs> um, that you've got this information hanging out there about your company that you might not want being presented about your company. You might want to update it. You might want to refresh it. Maybe you've had a big change in the company. And so you really need to ensure that you, you know who have the keys to the car, so to speak. And Carly, remind me, um, does the company page still have to be uh, associated with an individual? Yes. It okay. needs to be built on an individual's profile. And so we typically recommend, you know, the president of the company be the sole owner of the page. And then 
they can add people as administrators as, as necessary. Right. So that was a big change in the LinkedIn company side in the last two years, I'd say. You still have to associate a company page with a real person. That's why it's so important to make some of those. If you don't currently have a company page, it's important to make those decisions. And then you want to decide who are administrators to the page. So that's that's where it's really starting to be important. As with your LinkedIn profile for your personal self, um, for your business presence, it's really important to showcase your brand, tell your story, um, share really relevant content. Don't just be putting your product sheets up there. Um, share information that really makes sense with your target audience. Um, don't forget to engage followers. Uh, Carly just mentioned there's some new, really interesting targeting capabilities where you can really focus on who else is in LinkedIn in your industry vertical and how to make sure they're seeing your updates. Um, there's another thing that they've added that we're, we quite like. Now, I imagine that if you don't have a formal reporting dashboard for your company, you might have to go grab these manually, but um, the engagement analytics dashboard that you can see the data of who's viewed your profile, how long they stayed, what they did is really important. And um, LinkedIn shows up as a very um, specific referral in Google Analytics, doesn't it, Carly? Yeah. So, yeah. So you can definitely see in your Google Analytics if you're driving traffic to the web to your website via social media tools, you'll be able to see very clearly. Um, where some of your traffic is coming from. And now you can start to see what they're doing on the website and this whole idea of, you know, driving sales. You can start to see a whole bunch of things. Um, be very searchable by LinkedIn members. Make sure you optimize your page content. And th this is another one, bullet point number six. Um, I know I'm, I can't ask this question and see a show of hands right now, but I'd be interested to see if all the people who've joined us today online um, how many of you, if you went to your company page, if you have one, how many of your employees are following your company page? Because this is a mistake a lot of people make. They put their company page up and then the employees don't follow it. And that's a big mistake. Um, you need to show that your your company is popular with your employee base and to see who works there. And I know there was a time when people got nervous about this. They used to say things like, well, what if uh, – my competition goes and sees who works for our company and they're just going to recruit them. And it's like, you know what? They're going to do that regardless. Make your place, you know, make your company really look like a great company to work and make sure all your employees are following you and, and that they're sharing updates within their network. Cause this is how you really expand your personal and your business reach using LinkedIn. As part of your digital strategy and your overall digital strategy, as we've said before, there's no silver bullet here. It's not like LinkedIn is going to be the magic solution that drives all the leads to your website now online, but it's part of your, of your strategy. And it's a really important part. It can help build general brand awareness. I mean, I think you're, you're punished now by Google and you're, you'd be punished probably by your prospects if they went to look your company up on LinkedIn and didn't see you there. So, you, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very cost-effective way to promote general brand awareness. Um, it's a great way to build relationships and nurture them, albeit virtually, but it's, it's good. Um, I think the thing that most people in today's world um, are the most stressed by is our lack of time. And I know there was a time when, you know, we could take people out for lunch, they'd spend time with us, they'd want to engage with us. And it just isn't happening as much anymore. But reaching out and saying hi via LinkedIn, well, that's a perfectly legitimate way to keep in touch these days. Think about your value added content that you want to share. How are you presenting your company, not in terms of your products or services, but in terms of what you do for people? Because that's where you'll start to see information getting shared. Look at LinkedIn as part of your website traffic and how you're driving traffic to your website because it's a very important part of driving traffic. Look back to see how you're telling your story and whether or not you're showing thought leadership. If you're an industry influencer, um, LinkedIn is going to be very, very important for these reasons. 
The other thing you might want to think about as part of your corporate strategy is recruitment. Um, I mentioned that people get nervous that their competitors are in there recruiting their employees. And, uh, but you can be thinking about how you're attracting people to your company and whether they want to work for you as part of your company page. Partnerships that you might have, maybe you have partnerships with people in the industry. It's great to promote them on your company page as businesses or companies that you're interested in. And customer retention. I really do believe that when you're connecting with your customers and following their company pages and interacting with them, that it's an important part of communications. I don't know if you've noticed lately, and I know this is more of a Twitter thing, and I'm, I'm going to, it's probably more in the B2B space, but there's lots of companies these days who are handling customer service inquiries via Twitter. And it says you can tweet right, right at the company if you've got a concern. I was shocked yesterday um, in a conversation with somebody at, at CRA, Canada Revenue Agency, um, that they actually have a pretty good Twitter page and you can tweet to them if you have a question. I would have thought they would have been uh, just abused in Twitter personally. And I went to look them up in LinkedIn as well. Just, you know, nobody likes the tax man. But that being said, they have a very, very good uh, Twitter page and they've got 56,000 followers, which I was shocked by. Um, and for me, I didn't care so much about how many people were following them. What I did care about was it's a way to get in touch and ask a question and not have to go through their horrific website. And it's transparent too, right? You can see what people are asking. Mm -hmm. Other questions they've asked, uh, they had, they did a great use of video on the page, which I thought was really good. Like instead of just answering a question, they had somebody giving the answer in a video, which I thought was really cool. You can do that in LinkedIn and Twitter. So these are just a few little things that, that we want to, that you can, sh you can see or that we want to talk about. Um, so we're going to put up a comp an example of what we think is a really great company page. And we're going to tell you why. And I'm just, here's a little disclaimer. Um, I'm not putting it up because we helped develop this page. Although, um, we have the luxury of seeing some of the back end stats, so we also know how well it performed. But we're using this one because um, business to business client who has a very complex solution, they're in the manufacturer or in the in systems integration to the, some of the major manufacturers in North America. They go in and help um, improve efficiencies on the manufacturing floor. They sell the machines, they fix machines, they go right up to head office with solutions. So they're considered in the systems integrator category. Um, so this is a company called Grand Tech. And you can see when we first started working with them, they had maybe 50 followers and they're now up to over 1600. And the reason they got up to over 1600, and again, I'm not making you focus on vanity metrics, but the reason they did is because they created all this great value added content. We helped them with a machine safety guide, how to help safety managers um, look at machine safety on the shop floor and a couple other things. They update recently. Um, they have 150 of their employees following the page on LinkedIn. Um, there you have uh, Carly down here. She was uh, doing a cut and paste. Uh, it, it made me think that, uh, Sorry, it made me think that maybe she was looking for a new job, but you know, there she was and she was interested in what they were doing. Um, very clean, very simple presentation of what they do and why it matters. And every time they do a blog post on the website, they're also posting it here. They're very active in group um, discussions and uh, we just really like the way the page is set up. We invite you to go take a look at this one and, and see if you like it. Um, Cause I think it's, uh, it's it's well branded. It's got a call to action in it. Um, there's great keywords that talk not just about the company, but uh, in the description, all the employees, as I said, are following the company page and they post on a regular basis. The thing I want to just remind people, and I know I don't have to remind you about this, but the thing that we find the most discouraging is when we've got these orphaned social media sites. And I know we don't like to be judged as individuals or as companies, but if you're on a social media tool and you haven't posted since 2013, people are going to be suspect of that. And the most, biggest challenge today in the online world is you're trying to establish trust. 
You're trying to establish trust with people who've already bought from you, your customers, or you're trying to establish trust with prospects. What makes somebody distrust you really quickly is if they go to your company LinkedIn page and they see that you haven't done anything to it in three years. So don't leave what we call orphaned link, uh, orphaned social media accounts out there. So if you set up Facebook for your company and nobody's done anything with it in more than six months, take it down. If somebody's put up a company page on LinkedIn and you don't have the username and access to get into it, to change it and update it, and nobody's touched it in six months, take it down. You're better to not be on LinkedIn than you are to be there and make it look like you're not actively using it as a company. And I think that's a scary thing. We just recently deleted our Facebook account, although for our business, although it seems like it's next to impossible to get off Facebook, but we just didn't feel our customers were using it. We were getting no traffic from LinkedIn. It just seemed like a waste of time. And we are a small business. We have limited resources. We have to be where our customers are. And we know our customers are on LinkedIn. And that's where we're engaging with people actively. And Facebook was doing nothing for us. So we took it down and we made the brave decision to take it down. And I think we're still trying to figure out to, if it's been deleted properly. But the point of that story is, you know, use the tools where your customers are and do a good job of updating and publishing stuff regularly. So you look active. We're just about to the end of our, our, our uh, webinar today, and I, I know I've gone through a lot of information very quickly. Uh, I encourage you to um, definitely download the slides, but now is the time. Um, now is the time to put your questions in the question box. Type answer here. You'll see it in the right side of your box. If you have questions for us, um, we're going to pause for a few seconds now and please type in your questions if you have a question. Let's take a minute and get people to put their questions into the question box. Okay, I've got a question that's popped up. The question that I'm being asked is, who should manage your LinkedIn company page? It's a great question. And it comes back to what we were talking about, orphaned social media accounts. Um, uh, it comes back to who set the thing up in the first place. Um, so we think that whoever's managing your overall digital marketing strategy, or your digital online presence should be the one who's got access to your company page. But um, the one thing that we highly, highly encourage every company to do is to create a web um, digital assets document that gets shared internally across the company that lists all the information around how to log into a company page, how to get onto the website, where your web hosting is stored, how your URL gets managed. Um, we've got a template on our website if anybody wants to go grab it, this web access guide. But um, we highly encourage you to make sure that that's managed within the company because it's a key asset for your, for, your, for your business. But whoever's got access to changing things across your digital strategy is probably the people who should um, be responsible for managing it. Um, keep your questions coming. We've got one more here. Sorry, I'm just pausing to look at it. Um, question, I'm afraid of changing my profile because I don't want people thinking I've changed jobs or looking for a new job. So if somebody went into their profile and wanted to update information in their profile, and you know how sometimes it sends out an alert to your community saying uh, somebody's pictures changed, somebody's job titles changed. Carly, how do you handle that? Yeah, so there is a part on the sidebar of your personal profile, and it's and it just says turn off notifications. And so as you go in to refresh your profile, if you want to change your headline or your photo or any sort of um, job information, you can turn those notifications off so that people won't get um, updates on their home feed about you changing your jobs and or you changing your photo. And 
So, uh, and then after you've changed everything, you can turn your notifications back on or you can keep them off if that's how you would like to proceed. Yeah. So that's, that's a great point. Um, changing those. Um, here's another question we have from Valerie. How frequently should you update your LinkedIn page? You mentioned you take 10 minutes in the morning. However, most of the discussions happened uh, during the day. So how often should you check your page and be involved? You know, can too much be bad? Okay, so when I talked about the 10 minutes a day, I was talking about my personal profile. And then I just go in to see who's asked to connect. And, um, uh, you know, who's doing stuff, but on the company page, we think you should be looking at that weekly, we think there's information in there. Um, we do one post a week. We don't want to be bothering people. We don't want to be overkill. We know our audience pretty well through content, how we test them. And so we do one, one post a week. Um, but then we've got the team who are doing things. So in the end, the team might be two to three times. So company page, I'd be checking on a weekly basis. I'd be doing at least one post a week on the company page. And make sure then that within your employee network of people who are following your company page, they're doing things as well. So hope that answered your question, Valerie. Uh, another question here from Alan. Is it wise to accept LinkedIn connection requests from competitors in case they see potential customers or recruit employees? That's a great question. Um, and that's where a lot of people um, have struggled, particularly CEOs who are really afraid of social media. And this is one of the key reasons why. Again, here's my rule of thumb. How good is your relationship with this person? So if they're a competitor, but you worked with them at another company and you have a personal relationship with you and they've been clear about why you want to connect, then there's nothing wrong with that. If you don't know this person from a hill of beans and your competitor's reaching out, I'd say no. Um, but I would say no to anybody who reaches out and hasn't been clear about why they want to connect or why you think there's a good reason to connect with them. Um, and, you know, I, I hate to say it, Alan, but um, your competitor is going to find out who your customers are regardless and going through your LinkedIn profile. That's why it's so important that your content be better than your competitor's content and your website be better than your competitor's content so that you win in those situations because it's going to be hard for them to pick up the phone and start building relationships with those people just as it was for you in the beginning. So I would say treat competitors as individuals. And if it makes sense to compete, to connect with them as an individual, great. If not, then don't bother. Um, another question we have here comes from Ron. I accepted an individual on LinkedIn, but his company logo branded my page his company starts with the same name as mine and I cannot delete this logo for some reason wow that's a tricky one I've never heard that one before um Carly uh, any suggestions here Ron we might have to take this one offline and dig a little bit deeper and do some research for you I've never heard of that happening I would I would reach out to LinkedIn like corporate and uh, see if there's any sort of troubleshooting or customer support that they can help you with because that sounds very strange. Yeah, I don't know how that happened, but something might be happening in the background where it's pulling a logo from a URL. So maybe there's the wrong URL listed somewhere yeah. on his page. Well, yeah, it, look, it looks like you might have accepted to be like working at quote unquote working at his company or something like that. Yeah. Ron, I, I, we don't have a straightforward answer for you, but if you want to follow up with us online, um, Carly could maybe find out a little bit more at C A R L E I G H at marketingcopilot.com, And, uh, she'd be happy to help you, but I think you might have to put in a, um, change request to LinkedIn. And I, you know, to be fair, they're not great. Uh, they take a long time to get back to you, but um, do maybe put in a request and say, why did this happen and how can I get rid of it? Because uh, that's a weird one. We've never heard that one before. 
Do we have any other questions before we wrap up? Um, okay, I, I don't think we do, but those were great questions, everyone, and we really appreciate it. Um, so here's a last little note and closing thoughts. Um, you can get this presentation, the slide, the complete slide deck, slideshare.net forward slash marketing copilot. We've branded our, our slideshare account. You can email us. You can follow us on Twitter. You can contact Trish. Um, Trish has a full version and she'll be posting the recording of it. Um, just a reminder about next sessions. Mark your calendars next Wednesday, May 20th. Making email marketing effective in the lead nurturing process. That's going to get presented by one of our colleagues here at Marketing Copilot, Claudette De La Cruz, who's been studying the CASEL um, legislation very closely, and she's going to bring some great points about CASEL a year later and what's happened. Um, you can check her out on LinkedIn if you want. And on the 27th of May, I'm going to be back presenting Understanding Google Analytics to Make Better Content Decisions in Your Web Presence. And I'm going to be looking at a bunch of information in Google Analytics that helps tell whether or not your content's working either on your website or in your blogs. And again, my personal LinkedIn profile is linkedin.in forward slash marketing copilot. So two ways to connect and uh, please do connect with me, um, uh, especially if you say just heard your presentation and uh, uh, happy to connect with anybody who's been on the line today, especially if you want to ask more questions. So uh, as per webinar etiquette, we like to start on time and we like to end on time. Um, so uh Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And uh, please remember to register if you haven't already or get other people to register and join us next week for email marketing and join us for Google Analytics the week after. Thanks, everyone, and thank you so much for taking part.